I'm going to uh, talk to you about the the, uh, the precision oncology, you know, what we have learned over the last uh, 20 years. And uh, actually, I'm not going to talk about immunotherapy. Sorry about that. But I think after the our keynote uh, speaker, is almost like learned everything. I just enjoying the, the 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 talk just just so much, and and it just just such fascinating. And. Uh, so, so we have done this for about 20 years, and, and I have seen uh, the concepts changes evolves over the years. And we talk, we used to talk about uh, a lot about personalized medicine and targeted therapy, and and, and then precision medicine became the uh, the soundbite, and for many years. And uh, I think precision medicine actually is a pretty good concept because that sort of set the bar for our cancer genomic people. You have to make everything more precise and and, and, and and precision is not really our thing in biology. You know, we, we we used to say everything depends on depends on this, depends on that. So so uh, to make things uh, preci uh, pre precise actually is it, very important and it's difficult to do. And uh, in recent years, the concept has moved to precision health. And because precision medicine is more therapeutic oriented, and then now actually there's a lot of emphasis about precision nutrition and, and the precision prevention. So precision health actually uh, is even broader. And, and, and then we have been uh, talking a lot about the disparities. There are many health disparities in our country and around the world. And, and, and we have to make sure the, uh, the, uh, the new technologies are going to benefit you know, more people and more patients, not just a few uh, people who can afford the expensive uh, therapeutics. So I think all, all, all of us is the latest uh, concept and along the same line of uh, the precision oncology in general. So, so I think that the terms can be different, and, uh, but I think the, uh, the, the, uh, the core uh, of the challenge and mission remains uh, similar. And, and so we want to make cancer management more precise based on genomic mapping and molecular characterization. So I, I think that's sort of the, the, the central point of precision medicine. It's easier said than done, but, but I think that's our goal. And I think cancer genomic has been the engine, has been driver for precision medicine. And uh, there are many international consortiums, and I think the best consortium is the TCGA. It's supported by NCI. It's really served a role model for everybody uh, globally because you know the data sharing is so important. You can do all the fancy stuff if you don't share data, and, and then there uh, there's not much impact you can get. And TCGA really set the example of you know, sharing data globally. And data is out there; anyone uh, in in the world can get access uh, to the huge amount of uh, genomic data. So I think that's actually, NCI should be really well recognized uh, for this tremendous effort. And we are very proud to be associated uh, with TCGA. As Ilya mentioned, uh, we were very fortunate to be one of the seven uh, GDAC analysis center. We have done, uh, we have been involved in many uh, cancer types in the last 10 years. And, and, and Ilya and I uh, co-direct uh, this uh, GDAC center. So, so I just want to share with you some of our uh, projects we have done over the years, I think, you know, which are still meaningful today. So this is a paper uh, we published in 2011 in JAMA and using ovarian cancer model system. So back, so back then, so BRC1, BRC2 are very important genes, and, and it's important uh, for the cancer development and response to therapy. And back then, they're, they're really, uh, we don't, we, we did not use to separate BRCA1, BRCA2. We just called them BR, BRCA, BRCA1, BRCA2 together. So the, uh, the TCGA data for the first time allowed us and to actually look at the BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation separately because their sample size uh, was getting bigger. And, and then, so this was done by Da Yang and Sophia Kun, uh, two postdocs in the lab, and Da already has his uh, uh, faculty position in Pittsburgh. He just got his first R1 uh, last year, so he was very excited. And so, the, uh, so w we reported in a JAMA paper, so we found actually BRCA2 mutation is more linked 
to mutation burden. And at that time, we, we don't talk about mutation uh, burden. We call it uh, hypermutation. So basically, uh, we see uh, there's more association of uh, uh, BRC2 mutation with the number of mutations in the tumor uh, than BRC1. And, and, and also, we found uh, uh, the, uh, I don't have the slide for it. We, we also reported, it, and the BRC2 mutated ovarian cancers are more responsive to cisplatin-based chemotherapy, and the patient actually survived longer. And of course, now the, uh, it, it, it goes above uh, the cisplatin-based therapy, and now there's a PARP inhibitor, and it, it, there are several you know, products, and then BRC1, uh, BRC2 mutation, BRC1 mutation uh, has served as a marker for uh, treatment for, uh, with a PARP inhibitor. And, and so when, when we first published this paper, actually it caused some controversies, and, and, and a lot of people did not and, uh, feel very happy, and the BRC2 actually was a better marker than BRC2. BRC1 mutation, and, um, and there were a lot of criticism, and so we were actually very happy this funding has been validated in the last several years, not only in ovarian cancer, you know, we also see it in multiple cancer types. So this is a paper we published in PNS and focusing on gastric cancer. This is the international collaboration between the many institutions in the U.S. and, 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 and Tianjin Cancer Hospital. So, so in that study, we reported when we can actually combine the TCGA data in gastric cancer, the study group, I think Ilya was leading uh, that, uh, the uh, working group. When we combined those two data sets, and we, we, see this, we saw the same thing. So BRC2 mutated gastric cancer are more responsive to, to chemotherapy, and then the patients survive a lot uh, longer. In the last several years, uh, we, we have seen this in pancreatic cancer. BRCA2 has been a very important marker for pancreatic cancer and, 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 and also for, uh, the, uh, for prostate cancer. And uh, Ru Qinanyin just uh, came over here, gave a presentation, and he actually said BRCA2 was a much better uh, indicator for a response to uh, uh, the uh, uh, the PARP inhibitor in, in prostate cancer than BRC1. So we were actually very happy, and this all started uh, from the TCG uh, study. And the second story I want to uh, describe to you briefly in the cancer genomics, and it has really uh, allowed us to identify a clinically relevant patient population, and which can really change uh, the, uh, the, the patient care. And so this is a study uh, we, we used the endometrial carcinoma, and, and this was uh, published in uh, uh, GNCI a few years ago by uh, the first author, Yue Xin Liu, and uh, Russell Brothers is our pathologist. So, so we know the endometrial cancer affects a lot of young women, and relatively young women, obese women. And uh, the, uh, the textbook endometrial cancer, endometrioid endometrial cancer, actually, they're, they're considered actually pretty good cancer because they, you know, they, they survive longer. And a uh, lot of patients, the surgeon can remove the tumor and send the patient home, and then the patient actually pretty much cured. But however, they, always, uh, they always know there's a subset of patient, uh, even though they're the they're early, early stage uh, endometrial, endometrial cancer, they're young, and, and, and after surgery, they always come back. The, the tumor come back and, and recur and metastasize. So we want to identify this group of patient, and if we can identify this patient, and perhaps this patient can be treated differently. So, uh, so using uh, uh, the clustering analysis, actually, we identified uh, four clusters, and the first two clusters actually are the early in stage and in, in uh, early uh, low-grade tumor, and, uh, and and then so we're very interested in in the first two. So if you look at the first cluster, actually this is a textbook uh, cancer type. They're very hormonal related. So ESR1, PG1 uh, is high. So this is this is very typical textbook and 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 sort of good uh, prognostic uh, endometrial endometrial cancer. So we identify cluster two, which is highly interesting. So they they're not as horm hormonal uh, dependent compared to cluster one. And those patients are young, they're obese, and that's why the, the patient, they're doing worse. If you look at their survival, they're actually even worse than some of the, uh, the high-grade tumor. And so, so we saw that we have identified 
this group of patients, uh, uh, young obese women who had a tendency to come back and to recur. So we, so we want to understand uh, the genomic signatures for those patients. And so, so as you can see, like cluster one and two, the early stage and low-grade tumor, they actually have low mutation burdens. You know, now we call it tumor mutation burden. We didn't used to call them before. And so they have low mutation rate. And in the high-grade tumor, they have much higher mutation, uh, the mutation burden. And, and so, but if you, if, you look, if you look at, so basically they're, they're doing worse, not because they have a lot of mutations. And so we look at the specific mutation, as you can see here in, in the lower panel, and this group of patients essentially all have beta-catenin mutations, exon 3. And, uh, and, and that, that's important in the wind pathway. And um, so, so we think we have identified the molecular signature for those poor prognostic, uh, uh, the endometrial cancer patient. And then, of course, we want to design some treatment you know, uh, for those patients. Uh, but there's no drug for beta-catenin mutant. And, and however, we, we know the beta-catenin pathway is really well. It activates in a uh, wind pathway, activate uh, cycling D1. And, and then because of cycling D1 also activates CDK4 and CDK6. And then there is a drug, pulbociclib, and actually there's several drugs which can target in CDK4, CDK6. And this is a cycling D pathway. And actually this is the basis of project two for the uterine cancer spore project at MD Anderson, uh, which Russell and I co-lead. Co and so this, they're, uh, they're recruiting patients, and, and then we hope uh, uh, those group of patients can actually benefit you know, from this targeted therapy. So we think this is by identifying in a subgroup of patients, and which this really can change you know, how the patient get treated, we hope. So I think we're going to see a lot more of these examples in the future. And uh, so those are work I did at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and then uh, uh, three years ago, I moved to Wake Forest Comprehensive Cancer Center, and I was very attracted by uh, the, the precision oncology programs at Wake Forest Cancer Center. So there are two arms uh, in our program. Uh, one is a tumor tissue-based next-generation sequencing, and one is a liquid biopsy to look for cell-free DNA mutations. And uh, the, for, for the tissue-based uh, 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 the uh, uh, profiling, we, uh, you know, we're part of, we're the founding member of Precision Medicine Exchange Consortium, PMAC Consortium, use, uh, it's organized by Foundation One. So we're using Foundation One platform for uh, panel sequencing. And we're actually pretty fortunate because the, about a year and a half ago, FDA approved uh, the Foundation One uh, panel uh, for tumor uh, profiling. Actually, this is the first, this is only in uh, the FDA approved the test. And what's important is, and, and this test is also approved by Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, so CMS approved this test. So that means that the test can be covered by insurance. And so that means you know, this strategy, this technology can benefit more patients. Uh, so we're actually pretty excited, you know, being the uh, the founding member of uh, this consortium, and and we also joined uh, the uh, ACR Genie Consortium at this uh, second round, and uh, the uh, we so I attended uh, the winter uh, symposium, the summit of Genie Consortium, and I, I, I think this the, 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 it has the potential to generate another set of large data after TCGA. And, and, and then the, uh, with 70K patient uh, with genomic and clinical data. So we're very excited. And uh, this is another data set which we can investigate in you know, many uh, precision oncology related projects. And uh, so the reason I say it's very, uh, very important is, and you know, every institution are doing precision oncology, but they, everyone is dealing with a small cohort. You know, we just don't have any cohort. And then everyone can talk about successful examples. You, you find this signature and oncologists alter the treatment and, and then some patients benefit. But however, you just don't have the statistical uh, view, is it really statistically you know, significant? And, 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 and then the ACR Gini uh, registry, I think, uh, will allow us, hopefully allow us to do that. And in, in, in the future, the so basically we can make it more precise and, 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 uh, and then we know like which 
a specific treatment and can benefit how many patients. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, Winston-Salem, and the Wake Forest Comprehensive Center is, is located in Winston-Salem. I think this is the only city in the U.S. You know, with two tobacco names in, in, our, in, our, in our city. And, and, and this region uh, traditionally has been um, heavily influenced by tobacco companies. There are many billion-dollar tobacco companies, and a lot of our patients are uh, cigarette you know, smokers you know, or the previous smokers. And, and also we, we do have 14% uh, more uh, 14 to 15% uh, patients from African American uh, community. And, and, and also we know there are a lot of rural uh, patients and we're still trying to figure out you know, by zip code you know, who, are, who should be de dedicated, uh, designated as a rural patient. And, and then so we can actually um, uh, study and the uh, genetic signatures and the environment and trying to figure out the, the health disparity issue. So I want to talk to you about, uh, show you a couple of uh, data to see when, you know, what we learned you know, from this unique set of patients. You know, because a lot of smokers, and so it's not surprising we actually see a lot of uh, DNA repair related genes. And, and the BRCA2 is on, is, is on this list, as you can see. But, but also it's interesting, uh, we see another set of genes which are commonly mutated. They're chromatin remodeling genes. So they're, so they're not really you know, uh, recognized as DNA repair related genes. But we think because of this association uh, of the, uh, chromatin remodeling genes, we think chromatin remodeling actually is very important for DNA repair. And, and potentially they can be actively participate in the DNA repair process. So we're particularly interested in the, in the, uh, in the set of genes called K, KMT2C. And uh, we, ha uh, we have done uh, 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 a series of functional studies, and, and I'm not going to have time to, to go over the details of the studies. So they keep long story short, and we have shown the KMT2C, uh, which is known as the chromatin remodeling genes, actually is very important for formation of DNA damage foci and checkpoint activation and DNA repair. And, and we know the mechanism is, uh, is rec uh, recruited to DNA damage site by ARGO2 and small non-coding DNA damage response RNA. And uh, we're very excited about uh, the potential Trans, uh, the translation of this funding into clinics. So we know, we know BRCA2 mutation actually is not, not as common in lung cancer, and, but uh, the KMT2C mutation uh, actually is a lot more common, it's 10 times more common in lung cancer, and small cell lung cancer than BRCA2. So we, so we, we, we want to know whether uh, that would be a signal, that would be a marker for uh, the treatment selection uh, for a PARP inhibitor. So we have teamed up with Jeff Petty, who is our oncologist for lung cancer, and we're actually uh, setting up a clinical trial to see if, if patients uh, with KMT2C mutations, uh, whether they're more responsive uh, to PARP inhibitor. And, and lung cancer is a major challenge in our area, and also for, for the whole country and the whole world. So, so we hope uh, uh, this project uh, will lead uh, to some impact in the patient care. So another uh, aspect I want to uh, tell you is, and we're very interested in health disparities. And uh, so we want to see, uh, we want to know, you know whether the cancer from African-American patients, they have different uh, mutation uh, profiles. And so by analyzing our cohort, we indeed you know, found some genes are more, which are more mutated in African-American cancers, and some genes are more amplified, and, and so we, we indeed see the difference. And, and Vestin and, and, and Ilya, we, we actually look at the uh, TCGA data, and uh, actually we found validation of more PVD3 mutations in African-American patients. And so we don't really know why you know, we see more uh, PV3 mutations in African-American patients. There, there, there are multiple you know, potential factors you know, we, we want to look into. You know, one, one actually very interesting aspect is the menthol cigarette. And uh, I think FDA is, uh, is trying to ban the menthol cigarette. And the menthol cigarette has been targeted to minority African-American um, communities heavily. 
And uh, so we, we think uh, it's possible menthol uh, may play an active role in, in combination with mutagens in cigarette and, and causing more mutation. And, or you may just uh, cause more addiction, so the patients are more uh, 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 exposed to the mutagen. So those are the topic and we're actively uh, pursuing. And, and, and also alcohol, alcohol has been you know, shown uh, as an important uh, mutagen and, uh, for a number of cancer types. And so, uh, so the, the combination of alcohol and, and, and cigarette may actually uh, have some impact. So the last few minutes, I want to uh, describe to you about in our liquid biopsy program, which I, I, I find it very fascinating, very, very exciting. And this is, again, a collaboration with my colleague in, in, uh, in Tianjin Cancer Hospital and our, our oncologist at Wake Forest. And um, so the, uh, in recent years, there has been a considerable uh, growth in literature supporting uh, the value of circulating uh, tumor DNA in cancer uh, diagnosis, prognosis, and understanding tumor heterogeneity and clonal evolution, treatment selection, and monitoring of disease progression and response and resistance to, chemo uh, to therapy. So you basically see explosion of publication in recent years just because the technology has been you know, so much more powerful uh, in detecting mutations. And so we, 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 uh, we started this project by analyzing about the 177 patients uh, tr uh, treated at Week Forest, and, and those patients, the blood was drawn, and, and then we isolated uh, the DNA and sent it to uh, Garden Health using the Garden 360 platform and measuring 70 genes. And uh, so I, at first I thought, well, you know, I did not really expect too many you know, surprises. And I thought, well, just like in tumor sequencing, you're going to see more mutations in, in, in late stage tumor compared to early stage tumor. But then when we analyzed data, we actually were shocked. And so if you can see this stage one, two, three, four, the early, early stage tumor, you already see a lot of those tumor driving uh, mutations in the circulation. They're already in the blood. And it, the, the pattern is not so much different from the late stage tumor. And, and, and also we know the more mutation you see in the, in the, in the circulation, the patient actually is doing worse and no matter what cutoff you use. And so it, it's clearly, it, it's, it's very impactful. And, 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 and then we, uh, there's some patients that we actually have the liquid biopsy and the tumor uh, tissue uh, sequencing. So we were asking the question, you know, who are, you know, where those blood mutant DNA, you know, where, where do they come from? And, uh, and uh, you know, you, you, was, you were saying if the tumor, uh, they're large clones, and then they can easily, you know, get the tumor into circulation. But actually, that's not the case. And, you know, using clone, clonality analysis, we have identified you know, many like minor clones, you know, like harboring P53 mutation, NF1, beta catenin mutation, and those, even though they're a small number in the tumor tissue itself, but you already see that in the circulation. So those those probably are really the drivers. They can they they can get into circulation, and then and they're probably going to drive the metastasis, which really kill the patient. So so we so and so that, that triggered a lot of discussion among ourselves, and uh, the so we know the you know, currently tumor uh, patients are staged by the TNM system. TNM system has been around for many, many years. And, and so you look at the tumor size, look at lymph node involvement, look at metastasis. Basically, you know, if you're late stage uh, cancer, you, you treat it very aggressively. If you're early stage cancer, sometimes you do surgery and then you get sent home and, and, until it, it recurs. So, 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 so it's, uh, we, we know it's not a good system. And, and so now, so we, we think the, the circulation, uh, the uh, uh, look at the DNA uh, mutation in blood actually provide the missing piece in the staging. So we're saying in the future, the TNM staging system has to be replaced. So we propose a new uh, staging system we call the TNMB. So basically, not only look at the TNM, you also need to look at the blood. And, 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 and then the TNM may give you a low, low uh, early stage, but the blood actually will tell the oncologist Metastasis already happened. Got to treat those patients more aggressively, and and so we, we hope uh, the, uh, this this is going to be adopted uh, in the future. 
So just to give a summary of what have we learned, you know, we have learned quite a bit, and so I talk about the genomic characterization and, and next generation sequencing allow us to more precisely classify and group patient for prognosis and design specific clinical trials for treatment. I use BRCA2 and, and beta-catenin examples. And precision oncology effort and data provide a rich data set for novel hypothesis and hypothesis test, and KTM2 is the example. And, and, and finally, uh, the cancer staging system need to be updated to TNMB that incorporate mutation profiles in the circulation. So the, uh, finally, I, I, I want to uh, talk about the, just briefly uh, about the challenges. I think precision oncology is very promising, and, and, uh, and however, it is tremendously challenging. And the, the, the cancer heterogeneity is very difficult to overcome. So now we're doing a lot of single cell sequencing, and, and then the, every level you see, you, you, know, you, you, you just encounter heterogeneity after heterogeneity. So it's very hard, actually, to be precise, because it's like a moving target. It's not easy to be precise. And actionability issue, uh, there, you know, we have identified many mutations, but most mutations, there's no drug. You know, right now, they're only, probably only like 10% of patients, you know, you get the mutation profiles and then you can actually change the, uh, the treatment strategy. Most patients, you just have nothing, you just don't know what to do because there's no drug available. And that, that may uh, uh, improve with all the pharmaceutical companies developing new drugs, so, that, so this may improve. And reproducibility is, is another big issue. There's a lot of studies based on small sample size. So I think the Gini uh, consortium may, may help there. And cost issue, people don't talk about it too much. And all those, like immunotherapy, for example, it is, it is so expensive. And very few people can, can afford it. And it really can bankrupt your family to gain life just for a few months at present. And uh, so this, this thing, uh, this cost you know, has to go down because it generates a tremendous uh, disparity issue. There are very few people who have a lot of money, they can afford it. You know, most people cannot afford it. And, and, and then I want to point out that there, uh, because you're know, working with oncologists day in, day out, and then there's a major physician burnout issues. And the precision medicine is very difficult because it, it requires oncologists to you know, talk to everybody, insurance company, pharmaceutical company, talk to the patient. It, it just takes tremendous amount of time. And, and, and then they just don't have the time. They just feel burned out all the time. But of course, you know, PhDs are burned out too, so not just the uh, uh, MDs. And, um, and, and, and then there's a lot of physician fear. I think people don't appreciate as much. Uh, because the physician, they were not trained to, to understand all the genes, all the gene mutations. And suddenly they get a set of uh, molecular data and they have no idea how to interpret the data. And this is giving them huge headaches just, just looking at those mutations. And um, so, I, so I think the, uh, the, uh, it, the, the future has to be team medicine and, and team science. So basically the uh, clinical oncologists and, and basic scientists, genomic scientists, basically have to work together and to interpret the data and jointly design strategies to treat the patient. Treat the patient. I think if we, if we uh, work together more efficiently, and then I think the patient uh, will benefit and more patients will benefit. So I'm still very hopeful, even though there's a lot of challenges. Thank you very much for inviting me to give the presentation. Great talk. Um, Thank you. Yeah. You, uh, you made the disclosure that you're, a, you're not an immunologist when you started, so I'm going to make the disclosure that I'm, not, I'm an immunologist and I don't understand all the genomics. But, but, but when it comes to the endometrial group that you presented, I was struck by that cohort two that had low mutational burden, you know, but had the mutation in beta catenin. So I'm particularly interested, given the work we've been doing and many groups have been doing, you know, a couple hundred peer-reviewed publications on the impact of infiltrating T cells in the tumor. Have you been looking at that in that cohort of endometrial cancer patients? I mean, that seems like a, a perfect group to look at one of the defects and, and potential opportunities of maybe even less expensive immunotherapy that you could be employing there. 
Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question there. Um, the, the, there are actually publications and, and their immunotherapy you know, being used for to treat the endometrial cancer, but probably not that particular cohort, and, and because you know that's pretty still pretty new, and um, and you know, so far uh, it has not been used very much for endometrial cancer, and the uh, so we actually we we had a lot of discussion with uh, our oncologists, and our oncologist's view is immunotherapy is so. Ex Expensive right now, and and then the endometrial you know, cancer is not considered the worst cancer type, and so they just don't don't think uh, the immunotherapy should be used to treat the endometrial cancer. So it's not terribly, it's not really science based. It's more cost based, and um, and so ha having 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 said that, we actually put in a proposal you know, to, to study how the wind pathways uh, may potentially suppress immuno, uh, immuno response. And, and, and uh, we probably put it in too early. We put it in, I think, like five years ago and, uh, to separate in, in Texas. And the reviewer actually, at that time, they, were not, they did not appreciate the immunotherapy back then, and it was not funded. And uh, you know, I, I would love to, you know, you know, do more work along that line. Yeah. I you know, guess my, my last question, or a little yep. sub part of that question is, have the T cell infiltrates been enumerated or assessed like they've done for the immunoscore in colon cancer in, in endometrial cancer? Uh, you know? we, ha we haven't done that ourselves, yeah, but I, I think it's a, good, uh, it's a good thing to do. Yeah, we can, uh, uh, there, there, there are two ways we can do it. You can use a bulk DNA sequencing and, and then to, uh, to computationally, you know, Ilya has published a paper in immunology, uh, in immu immunity, and, and to talk about predicting you know, the, the immune, uh, different immune population in tumor, so we can do that. I, I'm sure you have that in, in, in your paper already. And, and then another project actually we're doing right now, you know, we were just at the very, very early stage, and we're doing actually some single cell sequencing, and uh, we have accumulated uh, a, a few endometrial you know, cancer projects. You know, in particular, actually we're interested in comparing the, uh, the different you know, racial uh, group, and, and you know, do we see uh, different immune uh, cell compensation. And, but we don't have the data yet. But I, I think I agree that's a, that, that should be a very informative uh, set of uh, study. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So very nice talk. So I, I really like the notion about including the, the blood disseminations into the tumor staging system. So I was wondering, like, so in, in your opinion, in addition to the circulating tumor DNA, so and, and I would like to idea on like whether or how we could include like this other like circulating tumor material, like circulating tumor cells or like uh, exosomes, those kind of things in the blood in the tumor staging system. Yeah, that, that's a that's a good suggestion. And so right so right now the uh, we are very mutation, very sequencing centered, and so I, I I think I think in principle you can easily incorporate you know other. Other molecules like microRNA, for example, and circulating tumor cell is certainly uh, important. It has been studied for many years, and uh, the I, I I agree with you. I, I think in the uh, we can uh, look at many factors in circulation, and uh, just right now it's just a concept, and and then we have to look at all the factors, and then eventually decide what are the most uh, clinically. Uh, relevant and I important, and uh, and also not you know, too expensive you know, uh, factor to include you know, for the clinical testing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.